break governance. So then we'll conclude around 2.15 and uh, in, as a part of that conclusion, we'll give you some updates on some of the upcoming events that we're gonna have uh, for the remainder of the spring and throughout the fall. So to get us started, I just kind of wanted to give everyone a little bit of a reminder that um, the faculty at UNT, we all have ongoing research opportunities. We're happy to partner with you guys. Uh, you know, part of doing these events is to bring light to practical issues that we are also addressing with our research. Um, and so we're happy to partner with your organizations to address any issues, identify trends, and provide solutions to help you navigate day-to-day -day concerns that you may be experiencing. And of course, uh, for the past year, this certainly seems to include uh, some issues that may have arisen due to the scenarios that we're living in due to COVID-19. Um, so our faculty is made up of a variety of different experts in a number of areas, including employee retention, improving work and non-work domains, employee identity, diversity and inclusion, team learning and support for employees among some other areas. Um, we also have a full strategic management group um, who do a more macro type of research as well, looking at KPIs and performance and things like that. Uh, we're pretty cheap, most often we're free. So if you're interested in utilizing some faculty led research in order to help you know, explore some of the key uh, facets of your organizations, identify solutions for some of your specific challenges that you've been facing, uh, please get in touch either with myself or with Kathy Western, or you can visit the website at www.cob.unt.edu forward slash HR. And we're happy to listen to you, learn about your situation, and work with you closely to curate a customized approach to fit your needs. So additionally, we also have an ongoing mentoring opportunity for HR students. Um, our SHRM chapter at UNT began a mentoring program a few years ago and has continued to see it grow. Obviously, it's kind of a weird time to be in a mentoring program. Um, everything is virtual, uh, but there is not a face-to-face -face requirement like we normally have. So it makes it a little bit easier if you're maybe not in the area or if you know getting to Denton is um, a bit challenging for you typically, you know, with work schedules and things like that. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor for an HR student at UNT, please reach out to one of us and let us know. I'd also like to say a special thanks and shout out to uh, the several of you who've made donations to our HR efforts, especially right now when our students have been going through so much in terms of, you know, being laid off from their jobs and things like that. Um, you know, we have various uh, scholarship opportunities. We have various uh, donation um, uh, out, out outreach, I guess, um, that is specifically geared towards, you know, people experiencing complications based on COVID. Um, so donations typically go towards uh, supporting students, faculty, and research. We also have additional scholarship and sponsorship opportunities for future events. Um, you know, we have our HR, uh, our SHRM students are about to go, well, virtually, they're going to attend a case competition. Uh, this is going to cost them no money because they're not actually leaving their homes or dorms. Um, but in the future, we hope to be able to once again take them traveling for things like that. So sponsorship opportunities for student groups, case competitions, things like that, as well as faculty-led research and doctoral student-led research. So um, again, if you're interested in working together to support any of these initiatives, please reach out, let us know. Uh, you can talk to me, you can talk to Kathy. Um, we're happy to discuss different opportunities with you. And finally, as we move into our program today, because um, you know we're all getting pretty accustomed now one year into the COVID scenario about how to utilize our Zoom meeting and our Zoom time. We want to have this Q&A session, but we don't wanna have the whole awkward situation where everybody's like raising their hand and trying to jump in and you don't know who's gonna get next. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat um, and then we will have those selected or we will select from those uh, questions to be asked during the moderated Q&A session. Um, so again, if you have a question that comes up during the talk, um, while Dr. Filo is speaking, please put it in the chat and we will select those for the Q&A session. So that pretty much takes care of the business portion for now. So without further ado, I'm really excited today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Joel Filo. Dr. Filo holds a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from Texas A&M University and has over 20 years of experience in HR leadership and consulting. He began his career in the US Department of Labor and has worked for a variety of companies, including Home Depot, PepsiCo, and JCPenney, holding roles in both HR and marketing. For the past seven years, he has been consulting as a principal behavioral scientist at N4 Talent Science. Dr. Pa Dr. Philo has a passion for helping organizations realize the value of people, and he uses his education combined with his experience as both an internal HR professional and an external HR consultant 
to guide companies in maximizing their human potential by leveraging data to drive business returns on investment through HR excellence. So please, thank you again, Dr. Philo, for joining us today. Please join me in welcoming me, Dr. Joel Philo. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Uh, if we move it into slideshow mode, I think it's still showing the ribbon on the left there. Thank you. So I'm really honored to be here today. This is a topic that I enjoy and UNT is a great organization. Kathy uh, invited me in today and it's just great to see so many people on and including some old friends of mine I see logged in and a variety of people that seem very interested in this topic. I will tell you that the future is now and there's a lot of things we're gonna learn about today that are happening. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to tell you everything that's happening because honestly, I can't keep up with it. So I hope today to spark some conversation and get you thinking, but uh, just realize that today is not going to cover everything that it could because artificial intelligence and human resources are both very broad topics. Do you want to go to the next slide? So I'm speaking on behalf of N4 Talent Science. N4 is really quite a large organization that you probably have never heard of. We're really gaining momentum and, and we're looking to get our name out there more, but we're an enterprise resource planning company, a cloud software company that's really focused on helping organizations to move into the cloud and run their business processes through the cloud. But in particular, my area of focus is on the human capital management space and talent science is a division of that. And we partner across human capital management to help our clients use the software as a service model to get better insights and, and really better return on investment from their human capital. We're part of Coke Industries. And so it's, it's really a pretty broad ecosystem that I work in. And it's fun because I get to work with many different industries and many different people, but all around the same topic, which is people and technology. Next slide. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what is artificial intelligence and what's happening in the world around us. I read voraciously. It's really one of the few things you can still do during COVID. So I am keeping up with a lot of what's happening out there. Maybe you are as well. And there may be things that aren't in here that you know about. Feel free to bring that up in the chat. But for those of you that maybe aren't as focused on people and technology, hopefully I'll, hopefully I'll introduce you to some things that are happening that you may not have even realized are happening. We want you to, to have some awareness as the first step in getting educated, but then what specifically can HR be doing in the realm of artificial intelligence? What are some of the possibilities? So we're going to spend a little bit of time dreaming, thinking about what actually is happening or could be happening. And then we're gonna get practical in the end around how as an HR professional can we get started? What can the role be that we play? All right, so I'm gonna jump into it and really it starts with what's happening and what is AI. And I love this picture here as the break to the next section because it is kind of reality now. You're on camera everywhere. There's data collected on you everywhere. Uh, this could be just some downtown in London. And the reality is artificial intelligence is using that data in an intelligent fashion and where are the people there uh, that are having the data collected on us. Next slide. So some of the changes, so on this next slide here, that we might want to be aware of in society is, number one, there's a lot of change. So you can see that if we just go back to the 1950s in America with, with Sputnik being launched, we got into this real science race. So science has become a, a huge focus in our country, really since the space race. It's been much more of a focus, and, and we've seen that impacting our society. Those of us who are used to the, art of the ATMs and getting our you know, monies directly from an ATM uh, may not realize that just came around in 69. Personal computers wasn't until 85 and the World Wide Web wasn't until 93. I graduated in 1993. And when I came to UT Dallas, um, sorry about that UNT, but I went to UT Dallas for my undergrad. I got my first email address and sent my mom an email. It was my first email and uh, she wrote back, LOL in her message. I didn't even know what that meant. Um, so my mom had a team teach me what LOL was. And things have changed a lot since then. World Wide Web was just the beginning. We had Wi-Fi, we had GPS. And then the iPhone wasn't even until 2007. But now it seems like iPhones have been around forever. We started getting into the Mars rover, gene editing, virtual reality, drone deliveries. And I actually probably can update this slide. Even today, I was learning more about the new mRNA vaccines that are really the, the salvation that we're seeing with these super fast vaccine developments. 
that's a lot of change that can impact our society as we can get into designer babies, et cetera. And there's new types of artificial intelligence and language creation now that allow us to artificially create text that's very realistic. You could be reading a Facebook post that was written by a computer that you can't tell that a computer actually wrote it. So all of these changes that are happening are accelerating. And that's really the point of this slide is that science is exploding. Next slide. And it's not just our society that's being impacted, but also businesses are being impacted as how we compute is changing. The mainframes were a big advancement and they had their peak and that's not really where things are going. Client servers and PCs grew and were a focus, but not so much anymore. Web 1.0 got us into e-commerce. I know when I was graduating in the 90s, there was that big dot-com boom and then the dot-com bust, but it wasn't really going away. It was just changing. Web 2.0, we get into cloud and mobile. Everything's mobile now. In4 designs mobile first and everything we do. We have to be mobile nowadays in the technology industry. Then you get into big data, which just seems like yesterday that was big news and now it's old news. Big data, analytics, visualizations, just skyrocketing. Internet of things and smart machines is a common term now. You probably don't realize that a hacker could probably come in and take over your refrigerator. I don't know what they'll do with it, but uh, maybe they can get into your home network and do worse things. Everything's connected. I know Internet of Things is big for our company. Smart machines are growing. These are all accelerating changes impacting businesses. And then artificial intelligence is just another example of business computing, which is going to be our focus today. But perhaps my next, next talk could be around quantum computing because that also is starting to take off. There's not enough to say on it yet, except that it's almost like magic, what you could potentially do in the future. So we're gonna to focus today on artificial intelligence, but just realize that there is quite a bit of change happening for businesses and how they compute. Next slide. And talent management is changing as well. So any of you that are in the field of HR may have some history on what has been and what is becoming. It was more about HR administration. And if we go back into the beginning of this timeline here of the 60s and 70s, a lot of it was focused on terms and conditions of work. How do you comply with regulations? And in fact, there was a lot more focus on HR because of the civil rights movement. So HR had a very important role to play in ensuring compliance. Ironically, DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is one of the top trends for this year, according to Society of IO Psychology. So there's still much work to be done in this area, but it started with a focus on compliance in HR. But then in the 80s and 90s, we got into more of a focus on HR practices. How do you design innovative ways of sourcing or who are the experts around compensation? How do we become a center of excellence and, and leaders around learning? And those things still matter, but the evolution was towards HR strategy. You may have heard a lot about how do you get a seat at the table in HR? HR isn't just a lower level function. It deserves to be in the boardroom. It deserves to be leading. And then the next slide here, there's another wave. So Dave Ulrich, if you click ahead, talks about HR outside in. So the next wave of HR where people need to be going is using HR practices to respond to external business conditions. So it's about getting up from the business table, getting up from the boardroom, going out into the world and bringing those best practices back. So as HR leaders of the future, we need to not just be thinking about how do I get to the table and how do I influence this table, but how do I leave the table and bring some innovation back to that table? How do I make my business more porous how do I improve DE&I within the boardroom? How do I ensure that we're focused not just on our current talent needs, but on our future talent needs as we deal with these social changes, the business computing changes, all the societal changes that HR needs to take a lead on. Next slide. So that's part of what we're trying to do today is just be aware of these trends. And I hope that in your time today, listening and, and in the dialogue afterwards, that you'll come up with some ideas of where you can add value and that you can bring those ideas into places where you have an influence. The Society of IO Psychologists is an organization that I'm part of that 
provides a lot of great insights. You can go to their website, siop.org, and find all sorts of stuff out there. But one of the things that you can see is the top workplace trends. And if we look at last year, there were 10 trends that were identified. Diversity, inclusion, and equity was number two in there. We also had data visualization, virtual working spaces, meaning and purpose at work, health, algorithmic selection, an area where I have a particular passion and expertise, automation of jobs and tasks, changing nature of work, and big data and the gig economy. You've heard all those things, but the number one trend for workplaces is the next slide, not surprisingly, and the focus of today's talk, artificial intelligence. So it's definitely going through its hype curve right now. This hype cycle that you see from Gartner is an illustration of what happens with a lot of technologies. Artificial intelligence in sort of the technical terms is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. But there's many types of intelligence that could involve intelligence around perception. So can we have machines process sounds and images more accurately than we could do ourselves? Yes, is the short answer there. Machines are much better at perception than we are. And the ability of a machine to recognize and produce images is, is astounding. Now artificial intelligence has gone quite far there. There's problem solving and reasoning. That's a section of artificial intelligence. There's more opportunity there. We're not as far along there. Knowledge representation and modeling. We have some advances there. Communication, language processing quite some surprising advances that are happening there. And then there's robotics and all of that is kind of bucketed under this idea of artificial intelligence. And the reason that I showed the hype cycle is because for many technologies and, and even subsets of AI, which uh, you can see in here, there's just this trigger, something happens, you realize the possibilities and people get really excited about what could be. And then they realize that it's actually harder than they thought and there's this trough of disillusionment where people think ah, it was all hype, but it wasn't all hype. It was kind of like the dot-com bust. That was a trough, it was a drop, it was a bubble bursting, but it wasn't an end. It was really a new beginning. And the reality is that it just takes longer than we think to get to that plateau of productivity, but it is a new world when you get there. And artificial intelligence is taking us into a new world and we need to be educated on that journey. Next slide. So that's really the next section here. The, the beginning was just giving a sense that we can't sit still. In fact, one of the PepsiCo is a, a change uh, management leader. One of the things that we were taught is that change doesn't happen until you create discomfort. No one's going to want to jump until there's a burning platform. And so I want you all to realize that there are things happening that's not the way it's been. Artificial intelligence is booming, even if it might seem hyped to you, it's not gonna go away. So let's dream a little bit about how we might be able to use it. And then we'll get more practical and educated on things to watch out for. Next slide. So when we think about human resources, there are many different components to it. And from a software standpoint, these are all different things that are HR software related that can be influenced by artificial intelligence. So in this circle, I put AI right in the middle because it can connect and supercharge the full talent cycle, whether you're thinking about just your global HR system of record, how you're managing talent, how you hire, how you teach, how you pay, how you plan your workforce, analytics, service delivery, all these things can be supercharged, can be improved by artificial intelligence and in fact, there's all sorts of advances happening in these areas. It's just not always connected and you may not even realize the advances that are happening. And I'm going to dig into each one of these in this next section and just dream with you a little bit about what can happen and point out what is happening to help to raise some awareness around artificial intelligence because the future is now. Next slide. So when we look at things like selection, which is a particular area of focus for me and some of my colleagues on the phone, there is a lot happening and data and automation can improve the reach, speed, accuracy, fairness, and quality of hiring without sacrificing the human touch. It's not a either or, it's really more of a both and. So 
there's all sorts of things going on. If any of you have ever heard of the term job board scraping, there's bots out there scraping job boards. It sounds kind of like some sort of dystopian anime episode or something, but it's just reality. You are able to have computers out there helping you to gather information and use it in your processes without much human oversight. Automated job descriptions can be created, especially with the advances in language processing, recruiting emails, all sorts of text that you might have had to put a lot of thought into, you can increasingly automate for better or for worse. You can reach out to candidates who are passive without necessarily having to have a lot of human interaction in that process. You can set things up to where you're Passive candidates are triggered according to formulas that you've set, and they're sent very realistic invites or outreaches. Now, the ironic thing is, even though all these things can happen, I do hear sometimes from some of our salespeople that there can be a backlash to that, where uh, things like uh, a handwritten, uh, you know, letter in the mail becomes much more powerful as we get more of these advances that allow computers to do things. Uh, if you know a computer's doing it, there can be a problem there. But it can also help you. You can create a talent community and cultivate it without a lot of oversight. Think about how farmers <clears throat> are able to handle much larger property now thanks to technology. You don't have to have as many people to run a large farm. You don't have to have as many people run a large talent community either. It can be cultivated with more of an oversight rather than as much labor. Candidates can be scored and insights can be derived on them based on technology. Uh, talent science has some special tools in that area and capabilities. If you want to understand who are the people most likely to be successful for a role and make sure that you're hiring the people that are most likely to succeed. There are many companies, including in for talent science that do that. Fair and predictive hiring algorithms are available. There's also not fair and not predictive hiring algorithms that are out there. So that's part of our next section that we'll talk about that you need to be aware of. Brand infused communications so that it looks very much like it's your company doing everything. Automated scheduling, the interviews that you're doing can be set up in a way that you don't have to put so much labor into getting that scheduled. Any of you that are in the recruiting field that have parts of your job that just seem mundane and boring and could probably be automated, you're right and it probably will be. So double down on the things that really matter on your creativity, your innovation, your people skills. There's recruiting chat bots out there that can deliver ROI. There's even data scoring of unstructured data. So whether it's text or whether it's trying to look through LinkedIn resumes or whether it's trying to look at micro expressions on a interview that's been recorded, there's a lot of different ways to score things and provide insights that didn't exist 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago. And then more and more interactive, evolving, gamified type assessments. So a lot going on here, and I really dwelled here because this is my area of specialty, but there's a lot going on here. Next slide. We also beyond, next slide. Yeah, beyond that have learning management where things are happening. So we have smart integrated accessible systems that can support continuous learning and growth. So there's proactively delivered micro learnings you can have things tagged and organized in a way that you're much more easily able to get the on-demand learning that you, may, that you need. Any of you that are in the learning space or the marketing space, you may realize that the most scarce asset increasingly in the future is attention. Uh, in fact, I'll be surprised if I still have all of you on this presentation by the end. I know there's so many things demanding our attention. And that's especially problematic for training. So the more you can have trainings be short, on demand, easily accessed by the user themselves, the better. And AI can help you with that. Personalizing the learning, having things that are games, but also helping you to learn and having coaches that are bots, but they're smart so they can really guide you. All these things are definitely booming and leading to lots of small companies so, you know, don't be surprised if for any one of these things I'm mentioning, there's some sort of new player on the market tomorrow that is able to deliver on some of this. And don't be surprised if in a year or two, they're part of a mega corporation. There's just so much consolidation happening because there's so much possibility happening. Next slide. 
Beyond learning management, we also have evolution in, click ahead there, payroll. So total rewards is what I like to call payroll. It's a better way of thinking about it, but we can have automated, continuously updated, localized and personalized employee compensation management. This is kind of a no brainer. So much that happens with payroll is just work that you'd rather not have a human have to do. All the different localizations, uh, compliance with the tax laws and making sure that you know, the currency and the um, all the you know, changing regulations get uh, adhered to. The personalized and intuitive rewards management insights are also coming up. Uh, I have a coworker who's moving on to another company focused on um, behavioral nudges around uh, using artificial intelligence with uh, fintech companies to guide people towards uh, smarter finances. Behavioral science is actually a, a growing field and it is part of AI and you can have incentives and options that really lead to win-win solutions and all of that is fueled by AI. Next slide. Scheduling, obviously big improvements there. Workforce management is an area that, that we're big in at Infor. We have some excellent workforce management tools with ROI easily demonstrated. I remember even at my time at JCPenney that we were able to cut payroll hours but drive up customer service scores and that was really through technology that showed where customers really were shopping and ensuring that the staffing aligned more appropriately with the customer flows where you ended up needing fewer people but you had them at more important times in the more important areas and you get a win-win solution where you're saving labor hours while also pleasing and serving the customer better and that was you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> things have advanced much farther since then. We can really make sure that you get the right people in the right shift at the right time. Teams that are designed well at, at Infor, we have team dynamics as an offering as well. There's personalized alignment of workers with business needs. You can really optimize how you manage your workforce and track them. Do watch out. People don't like being tracked. So be aware that there is a downside, a dark side to a lot of this. And we can use big data to infuse our workforce planning. Next slide. With HCM analytics, there's integrated insights and data-driven decision automation with intuitive visualizations and human oversight. That's all possible. So when you're dealing with human capital data, you can see it like you never could before. You can have flags and prompts that help people to do what needs to happen. So it's not so much just about prediction anymore. It's moved on to prescription. So we're trying to not only describe, but also predict, but even better, tell people what to do so that it happens. And that can be done more and more. So human capital management analytics is certainly helped by artificial intelligence and it can be taken to the next level of actually driving behavior. I know I deal with that a lot in the selection space where you try to show the ROI, look, the predictions worked, but the ROI is not what it could have been because no one actually followed through on them. So you really have to have a marrying of good data and good execution and AI can help with that. Next slide. And then just basic HR service delivery. I need help. Uh, you don't necessarily have to talk to your HR professional every time you have a benefits question. There can be a smart, friendly, and helpful bot there to mediate between the people and the business needs. It is more and more common for people to be interacting with someone who's not actually a person. And that bot actually can be more and more realistic. Although ironically, there's some research showing for instance, when screening on depression, that people are more honest when the bot looks more like a robot and they're less honest when they believe it's a real person they're talking to, even if it's not. So uh, there's definitely a lot of research to be done as we learn how to do things in a more automated and realistic fashion. Sometimes you don't want it to be too realistic because you might feel more comfortable talking to someone that you know is just a robot um, and you also don't want to be talking to a robot when you don't realize it's a robot that can be um, ethically concerning as well. But there's a lot happening with HR service delivery. Next slide. And then the data lake. We talk a lot about data lakes in our organization. It's a major focus for N4. It's one of the big advantages of moving to the cloud. Many of you on the call are probably familiar with data lakes, but those of you who aren't, it's the idea that you have all this data and the future of business is really data. So the, the kingpins in the future and, and even today, the FANG companies, you know, Facebook and Apple and Amazon, 
uh, Netflix, Google, like they're all similar and not so much around technology, but around the vast amounts of data and how they use it. And AI can help you use it better. So with integrated HR data, you can actually deal with the volume, variety, velocity, and veracity of the people data and related to business sources. And of all those big data components, one of the biggest challenges in HR is around the veracity. So the, the volume may not be as much as some other areas like uh, the point of sale system. Uh, the velocity may not be as bad, but the challenge with AI data for anyone who's ever done turnover research, for instance, is just, we don't record things very well and uh, we, we don't have good data often. So. AI can help, but there's definitely work that needs to be done to allow it to help. So we need to flexibly store high volume data in a way that is more standardized, that, that's deeper, that's more valid, and then make that high velocity data digestible in a smart, useful format that leads to actual useful and, and ethical actions. How you tag it, how you use it, it all matters. Next slide. So I know this is drinking from a pipeline, from a, from a water hose here, but I just wanna keep flowing with some of the things we can do. Talent management can definitely be helped with smart, personalized and strategic talent nurturing and pipeline autom automation. So you can really guide people on their career journey. One of, one of the things we do in our tool is help people understand where's the next role where they might be a good fit and help organizations look down their talent pipeline towards the fit of different groups to this higher level leader role, especially for underrepresented groups. So that from a DE&I standpoint, you can see why are fewer people moving up the pipeline from certain groups? Is it because of the way you've set things up and some disadvantages there? And how do we change those so that they become uh, more of an equal playing field for everybody? So artificial intelligence can really help you with guiding employees and giving coaching that's based on real data and, and just doing behavioral nudges and, and engagement that moves people towards the strategic goals of the organization. Next slide. So where do I start? I've, I've really covered a lot around possibilities and it was really just dipping my toe in what could be done. Uh, there are many ideas uh, that other people have that aren't even on here that you can dig into if you just wanna do a little bit of your own research, but there's some things you gotta watch out for. So this next section is important because you need to think about the quality of the data you're working with, especially if you're in HR. This is really focused on HR professionals. And one of the first things is to understand where AI is happening in your organization and what's the quality of what's feeding into it. So just like it's smart to know whether all your appliances are connected to the internet, it's good to know in your house what is a smart appliance in your house and how safe is it and what's it connected to and what's it doing? Is Alexa listening to me all the time? These are things to know in your organization. It's also good to know where am I using people data in more of an automated fashion? And is it being used based on accurate data? And is the output that's happening accurate? And what are the impacts lo locally? So where is AI being used and what are the risks is really step one. Next slide. You also wanna think about balancing data and intuition. So I like this slide and this quote from Dr. Charles Handler, who really has a good view of the future of recruiting in that we should use the economic bounty generated by AI to double down on what separates us from machines, human empathy and love. So AI can produce crucial insights, but only humans can deliver them with care and compassion. You may have been watching as we were competing in chess with, I think it was uh, Deep Blue from IBM. And uh, eventually I think it was Gary, uh, I forget his last name, but he was, a, he was a chess master and he lost. And it was sad when our best chess player lost. So we then saw that humans were better than us at chess. And I kind of stopped following the story at that point. And a lot of us may have this feeling that we're just gonna lose to machines and that Terminator is gonna come true. And in the end, there's no way that I can improve my brain faster than science can improve AI. But I got some heart when I did some more research and saw that today centaurs are the best chess players. So we do know that computer chess players beat human chess players. That's just a, a given. Uh, it's very difficult for a human to beat a machine, but a centaur, a centaur will tend to uh, defeat both. And although I do like fantasy novels and I do know that a centaur is like half human half horse, that's not what I'm talking about here. A centaur in chess terms is somebody who is using a machine to help them in their chess playing. 
It's a team of a human and a machine. One of my favorite games is Words with Friends. Words with Friends will give me some ideas on where I might play words. It will give me some hints and tips, but ultimately I will decide what to do. The machine doesn't. And in chess, the people that get the tips, the hints, the guidance from the machine, but also use their human intuition are the ones who win most often. And I think that that's valuable for us to learn in HR because we're not going to abdicate to the machines. In fact, being part of Coke Enterprises now, one of my biggest challenges is that our new company is extremely focused on the power of human judgment and ensuring that frontline managers take ownership for decisions. And one thing that I have to, to keep getting the message across as we're a technology firm and especially with HR technology is that the goal is not to automate the leadership of people and to automate people entirely. The goal is to augment people and to give guidance. And ultimately this is, is always gonna be a blending of data and intuition, uh, not one or the other. Next slide. You also need to be aware of privacy. This is a really big area right now. It's only growing. Uh, Tim Cook had a, a nice quote that I, I thought was worth putting here. Platforms and algorithms that promise to improve our lives can actually magnify our worst human tendencies. Every day, billions of dollars change hands and countless decisions are made on the basis of our likes and dislikes, our friends and families. Taken to its extreme, the process creates an enduring digital profile and lets companies know you better than you may know yourself. Your profiles then run through algorithms that can serve up increasingly extreme content, pounding our harmless preferences into hardened convictions. And there's uh, some movements out there trying to create a universal basic income by giving us the ability to sell our data and say, you know, that all this data collected on us is um, owned by us as humans and a brokerage house could be created and you can get a monthly fee for use of that data. Um, based on what I'm reading, that's probably not gonna go anywhere because a lot of the data is actually not yours because data is really considered facts, like your geolocating data, where I've been, my phone has that. Um, and I, I like to think that's private data, although it's really not as private as you may think. And it's actually facts where you've been and you don't own that data. But as an HR professional, you need to think about the data that's being used and who does own it. And even if there's not a legal right to it, is there sort of a moral right or a concern that'll arise out of using that data? You, you can't stop the technology. It's, it's going to happen, but you can be smarter about it and try to guide your organization to be aware of the, the pitfalls and the things that could get you in trouble. Next slide. So learn from others' mistakes. Machine learning can go awry without proper oversight. You know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, there was a Microsoft chatbot that was put out there for fun where you could, you know, sort of guide it in its development of language. And it, it just took a couple of tweets before it became an anti-Semitic chatbot. We have a lot of trolls out there on the internet um, and that can be problematic. We also have people that are concerned about AI as a gatekeeper and laws are evolving in response to that. Illinois has some artificial intelligence laws that came out in 2019. Uh, Facebook was having to defend itself based on which jobs were being shown and whether it was being compliant and how it was showing those jobs because its algorithms were kind of a black box algorithm that was leading to some discrimination. There's also new laws in California that I don't even have on here around artificial intelligence and hiring. We have to stay abreast of what's allowable and decide if we're gonna be a leader or a laggard, and there's disadvantages to both. Um, but if you are going to be a leader, you need to be especially aware of privacy laws and where other people have made mistakes. Even in uh, recruiting, we get into problems if you're scraping LinkedIn resumes. There's a company that was doing algorithms based on uh, the LinkedIn resumes, and people would lose points if they had gaps in employment. So you would tend to get a lower score if you had gaps in employment which seems to make logical sense. We tend to have a bias towards discriminating against people with gaps in their employment. That looks bad. However, that leads to lower scores for females traditionally, because on average, females will tend to have more gaps in their employment history, and therefore they will systematically have lower scores, which is against the law. So we need to be aware of privacy and mistakes that have been made. Next slide. And then just no basic statistics. So. There's a true correlation between the number of churches in a town and the number of liquor stores in a town as towns 
have more churches, they tend to have more liquor stores. Towns with many churches have many liquor stores, few churches, few liquor stores. So should the government try to reduce the amount of drinking by reducing the number of churches? Well, if we assume correlation equals causality, we might take that route. Um, if we think we know everything um, based on just how things are relating, we can make bad choices because obviously the underlying variable there is the size of the population. And as towns get bigger, they tend to have more churches and liquor stores. And that seems like a stupid example and we should know that, but there's just so many things that are confusing if you don't think about the statistics behind it, if you don't think about sample bias and AI is based on all of that. Another great example that I've heard is that you actually are uh, more likely to die in the hospital if you um, were in a car accident than a motorcycle accident. I'm sorry, you're more likely to die in a hospital from a motorcycle accident if you had a helmet on. So motorcycle riders who had a helmet on are more likely to die in the hospital. And that's seemingly because, oh, I guess the, the helmet made them more likely to die, but actually it's because of a bias in the sample. Motorcycle riders who did not have a helmet die on site and rarely make it to the hospital. So the motorcycle riders that got to the hospital who were not wearing a helmet, it probably wasn't a bad accident. If they got to the hospital and they were wearing a helmet, it was probably a real bad accident. So this fact that having a helmet means you're more likely to die from if you're a motorcycle accident person in the hospital it is a bad fact. It's not understanding all of the background. I only bring that up because that kind of stuff can impact you when doing AI, not really understanding sampling bias, not understanding the black swan, not understanding what could happen, not understanding all these different things. There's just a whole different world of math when you get into AI. So know your basic statistics at the very least. And if you're really gonna go deep into AI, then you should know your advanced statistics too. Next slide. So I'm gonna kind of wrap up with how the work is changing. There's gonna be a lot of slides in here. I'm gonna kind of go through them quickly because I know we're, we're getting shorter on time, but the 2030 workforce is only 10 years away and, and it's changing, it's changing fast and COVID only accelerated those changes. Next slide. So one way that is changing is automation. So there's a prediction of a 30% increase in average output per worker due to automation. Those productivity gains will vary broadly across industries, 10 to 55%. Uh, manufacturing is expecting huge increases in productivity from automation but even educational services. I mean, who knew that learning could go remote? And those of us who are dealing with remote learning know that it's not perfect, um, but we also know that it's better than nothing. I mean, I'm grateful that we have remote learning and that I'm not just having to entirely teach my four boys myself without any sort of remote learning. So automation, all the advances in technology, definitely changing industries. Next slide. Rising wages in China will stimulate investment in automation. So this automation is only going to accelerate as China joins the world stage as a premier player with wages you know, increasingly similar to US wages. And that means we can't just outsource everything to them. They're not the cheap provider that they were, but rather they're getting the benefits of automation and pushing automation through their advancements. Next slide. And then the next generation robots are actually becoming a reality faster and faster, especially in this last year with COVID. Uh, these charts were put together before COVID hit and it's only accelerated the development of collaborative robots and the average hourly cost of manufacturing workers by country versus cobots. And, and this was back in 2013, was just continuing to go down in price where only China and India were cheaper than cobots and China and India are both increasing in terms of their wages. And as we have things like COVID show us that humans sometimes just can't show up and work because of a global pandemic, it increases the focus on getting robots in place. That is sort of an aspect of artificial intelligence. There's automation, there's intelligence behind that. It's not going away, it's only going to accelerate. Next slide. Automation could eliminate 40 million jobs in the US and depress wage growth. I have many friends that are you know, struggling um, with COVID taking away jobs. And I'm sorry for anybody who is um, suffering with underemployment or unemployment right now. Uh, that could happen even more in the future. So we're going to see a lot of workers displaced as we have more automation. Next slide. 
In retail automation, will create new job functions, but fewer full-time jobs. So there's a potential 70% job loss projected there. I have a lot of retail clients. I had a lot of retail clients. I don't have as many now. Um, I have more healthcare clients now. Retail is really being disrupted and it's not just Amazon. Obviously they're a big player, but it's just the way things are operating is changing. And so anybody in retail is definitely feeling the job losses and how things are changing quickly. Next slide. And it's not just with retail. Healthcare is also automating. They won't have as many job losses, but they will have jobs change and jobs get lost. So automation is impacting many different industries. Next slide. The US service sector automation could displace labor two to three times more rapidly than previous transformations. So if we think about the shift from agriculture to industry, that was a big shift. My grandparents were farmers and they were some of the last farmers. My um, mom actually had an outhouse growing up in you know, far upstate New York. And um, they were sort of like outliers there, but that was a big change as we moved to industry and that displaced a lot of labor. I know, you know, many farmers were out of work as there wasn't a need for as many farmers and manufacturing really boomed in the US in particular. But as manufacturing started to decline, especially during the stagflation of the 70s and, and you know, just the, the focus on other areas of the economy, you, know, you start seeing the rust belt emerge and that displaces workers. And then construction collapsed, obviously with the financial collapse and getting overextended with housing that led to some loss of jobs, but none of that compares to the number of jobs that we're potentially gonna be losing going forward during the great transformation. So we're looking for a major displacement of the workforce that needs to be prepared for. So artificial intelligence is exciting. It's also scary. And like all technologies, it's gonna be good and it's gonna be bad. And you just have to decide how you're gonna deal with it. Next slide. So automation will affect 80% of workers through wage suppression and job loss in a lot of cases. So there obviously are opportunities for people like data scientists that it wasn't even really a term. And now it's one of the top jobs out there. But for many jobs, you're going to see wages get suppressed or jobs lost entirely, especially in the service sector and especially in this past year. So COVID, like I said, was an acceleration in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And thank goodness for some economic recovery and some stability, but it's not going to last forever. And especially in HR, as we get up from the, the you know, boardroom and try to bring ideas back, we have to be prepared for these changes that are happening and think about how we can help society because business increasingly is not just about serving shareholders. Um, in fact, more and more business leaders are understanding that they have many stakeholders, uh, including uh, the organization or the, the communities they serve. And it's not just about making money anymore. Next slide. There could be worse outcomes for lower income workers. So certainly automation is gonna impact that. Whether or not the minimum wage goes up, the reality is there's gonna be some suppression from automation and we're gonna to have to figure out how to deal with that. Next slide. So it's really a balancing act and you can fully populate this slide because I know we're running out of time here. So just kind of click through and uh, get it fully populated. But in terms of the society of today and the future, um, it is a balancing act. So if you wanna just click, uh, if you keep clicking, it'll populate this slide. Yeah, just kind of click until you see the boxes. Yeah, thanks. So the traditional view from society is about humans. We're moving towards more robots and machines. We actually, in the last few years, have focused a lot more on technical skills. We've thought that it's all about technical skills, and I definitely want my kids to learn technical skills, but the social skills in the future are going to be much more important than we realize. It's much harder to automate social skills. You don't necessarily want a robot to be your judge. Uh, you don't necessarily want a robot to sell to you. You don't necessarily want a robot to be your leader. So the arts and, and, and the social skills will be more important in the future. We need to make sure that we learn those areas. Full-time is moving towards project-based. Full-time work isn't what it used to be. Work-life balance is more about work-life integration, which many of you working remotely know now. It's less about balancing it, more about just fitting it in. The growth mindset from Carol Dweck is really growing. The idea that you can improve in areas. It's not just that there's some maximum for you, but rather you can improve and you need to improve. Things are continually changing and we're all going to be continuous learners in the future. The age of the expert is over because things are changing too fast. Command and control is really falling by the wayside. 
not every company realizes this. I certainly work with a lot of different companies and autonomy is not the focus for all of them, but even the ones where it's not a focus are feeling the friction of autonomy rising. More and more we're dealing with, with uh, teams of teams like networks and, and bottom up power. So we need to move towards skills and abilities and less about just the formal education, uh, move towards being more of a generalist, move towards meaning instead of security. Security is gone. Uh, the idea of just working for one company for 30, 40 years and then getting a pension it may still happen for some people. Uh, it's not likely to happen for most people, but meaning is possible. And more and more, especially with Generation Z are in a search for meaning and HR professionals who can help an organization be meaningful can help that organization attract top talent. And it's more about a lattice than a ladder. Structurally, you can see all these changes as well with more gig employees, more automation, more speed and agility where you're working from anywhere, remote work is not going away. When we ripped the Band-Aid off last year and saw how much we could do remotely, it's gonna be hard to put that back together. Uh, Humpty Dumpty is never gonna be the same and the laptop economy is booming. Obviously there's still need to be on site and I'm very appreciative of all the people that are out there working directly with the public and that's still going to happen but working remotely is only going to increase and there's a lot of impacts from that. We're moving towards self-organization. How do we in HR promote that and allow people to have that empowerment to self-organize? We're moving more towards tasks than jobs. So we have to be able to disaggregate more and be a little more flexible and fungible in how we interact. And total wellness is much more of a focus, even organizational wellness, organizational health. It's not just about making money, but it's also about being sustainable and talent has to be mobile. Next slide. So really with a focus on HR, we need to realize that our role in human resources has evolved and we need to help our leaders find and align people for jobs that don't yet exist while looking for technology that will initially augment and eventually replace those same people. We just need to have candid conversations and have authenticity about the reality that things are going to change and HR can't just please the higher ups anymore. They need to shake up the higher ups in order to ensure organizational sustainability. Next slide. So just to wrap up, you really, if you go back one, need to think about what role you're going to play. You can be a change art architect. You can really help the organization think holistically, find root causes, causes, craft a strategy, and, and really help AI be unlocked, help AI transform your organization in a positive way by being the architect of all that change, or at least be a leader of it, be informed and help to push for change in HR, help to push for implementation of ethical AI or at least be an administrator, be informed, understand statistics, understand what's happening, and just be a good team player who is aware. Or you can just try to step back and not have a role in it, keep your head down, try not to think about it. And I think that can work for a while also, but ultimately we're all gonna get wrapped up in this change. The change is coming. We just need to figure out what role we're gonna play in it. Next slide. So that's really all I had. I know I was talking fast, there was a lot covered. There was a typo, typo or two on the slides and I apologize for that, but I hope that it sparked some thoughts for you. And I would love um, any thoughts that you have. I, I'd love to respond to any chats anybody has. Um, I'm just gonna pause here for questions. Great, so we don't currently have any questions yet in the chat. Um, so if anybody has like one question right now and then in the interest of time, we're gonna move to um, Dr. Sidorova as well. And then we could do a general Q&A at the end. So if anyone wants to jump in really quick, like if they have to go, um, does anyone have a question they want to pose for Joel just yet? You just covered it all, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, well, oh, ahead. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go ahead and jump into uh, Anna's um, work real quick too. And then we'll have a general Q&A at the end. Um, so think about those questions that you want to ask either of them <laughs> um, and go ahead and put those in the chat and we will come back to the Q&A session at the end. All right, so without further ado, we will have 
Dr. Anna Sidorova, who is an associate dean within the G. Brent Ryan College of Business. And she's going to be talking to us a little bit today about some of the work that she's doing on organizational AI, tying in kind of some of the stuff that Joel just talked about um, in terms of governance, um, organizational governance. So, Anna, go ahead. Uh, Julie, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes. Okay. So, well, hi, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, thank you for being here, but particularly thank you, Jill, for doing such a great introduction that I do not need to do any, to cover any bases right now. I can just jump right in and I can even reference your slides. So uh, it's wonderful. So um, just to add a couple of things about myself now, <clears throat> I'm here in the College of Business and um, I'm an Associate Dean. I'm also with the Information Technology uh, Decision Science Department, but um, I also co-lead the the initiative that is uh, the goal of which to create a applied AI research center. So I work with folks here across multiple colleges. So Natural College of Engineering, because they have a lot of um, basic AI research going on there for, for many years. But AI research really doesn't reside only in the College of Engineering. It is across multiple colleges um, in this university. So we have folks here in the College of Business, but also uh, people in the College of Health and uh, Public Service doing AI related research. We have people in the College of Information doing related research. And of course, uh, College of Science rely on a lot of AI for their, uh, for their purposes. So uh, there are a lot of things going on at the university here. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is something that is my pers personal passion, research passion, and I hope that it will be somewhat relevant to you guys, at least you'll be able to relate to it more than to some of the more technical research that is going on. So um, without going into the long introduction of what AI is, especially given that Joel has done such a great introduction, um, you, have, you recall that Joel had this uh, hype cycle from Gardner, and somewhere at the very, very left of that hype cycle, sort of the emergent trend was AI governance. And it's been sitting in that emergent trend for several years now. It sort of appeared there and it does not move anywhere because people want to talk, hey, we're doing AI governance, but it's really a very large beast and it's very difficult to approach it. So uh, my personal passion is that beast, is AI governance. And to give you a little bit of a motivation, let me set a scenario for you. Let's suppose you receive a lot of resumes. And again, I'm not a uh, talent management professional, but I can appreciate the, the issue of hiring people. People put a lot of good things on their resume. And those, those things sometimes are not very honest. And let's suppose a company comes to you, one of those new emergent companies and tells you, I can help you screen for resumes where people were fudging their resumes, were putting some not so much relevant stuff that they do not really believe they have, especially as far as skills are concerned. Now, the, the link that I have here is to a company that actually is an existing company and I know the co-founders of it. That's not one of the use cases but uh, the, what the company helps you do is it helps you predict the probability that somebody is lying by analyzing how they enter data into a web form. Just how they move their cursor, how they, the speed of typing, et cetera. And they can flag somebody who is putting data into your system by saying, well, most likely that, that person is, uh, is not telling the truth, or at least is questioning what they're putting in there. So let's suppose a company like that comes to you and says, hey, I can solve your problem. Um, go ahead and let's incorporate our software within your application system, and it will help you screen for those potential cases where you want to go and run additional background checks. And so the question to you, should you go ahead and adopt such a solution. Now let's step back one step further is, how should you even approach making such decision? Who should make such decision? What criteria should you be looking at while deciding whether to 
even spend time uh, looking at this uh, solution or not. So I do not have the answers for you. I'm sure that you can all kind of imagine how your particular company would approach it. Uh, or some of you may say, oh, it's not a problem at all. Of our applicants tell the truth, always. So, but I'm going to step back and Um, next slide. I think I muted myself accidentally. Um, okay, so uh, just to check, you were hearing that I was saying I was not muted all the time, right? Yes, not the whole time. Okay, good. All right, so um, now we are here at the research institution, right? So um, our goal is not to answer a question for a particular company that would be a consultant for you. Our goal is to create some kind of a theoretical framework that would help companies um, in a broad sense to arrive at their own solutions. And therefore the question that we are posing here is what should be the design principles for designing governance structures to protect the interests and investments of the key stakeholders during the deployment, development and the use of artificial intelligence. And this part of the definition, definition protect the interests and investments of key stakeholders that is one of the key definitions of governance, right? So the governance is there to protect the interests of stakeholders. And now naturally, this is a very broad question and it doesn't exist in a vacuum. So when we academics come and try to approach this question, we look at what has been done and where. And to give you an idea with this particular question, there is a lot of literature on organizational governance. It's organizational theory, institutional economics, and they give a lot of very relevant high level definitions. At the same time, there is an ongoing discourse, both public and in private companies on ethical trust with the responsible AI. And it talks about the ethics principles as related to AI, um, the various frameworks about around fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics in AI. And again, that is an ongoing debate, not necessarily related to governance directly. Now, at the same time, AI is a type of IT system. So there are already a number of IT governance frameworks that are out there, but AI is different from your typical IT and that's what we want to resolve here, but we do not want to completely forget about the existence of those. And then there is the entire field of regulation from the political science and from the public sector that talks to us of how do we regulate any field, and that is your regulation theory, and AI specifically because there are uh, public debates on should we regulate AI. Next slide. So what my work is, is by looking at all of those different types of literature, how can we integrate it in a way that provides some guidance, some kind of a map through which you can, or a lens through which you can look and try to develop your own AI governance structures within your organization. And this is right now, it's work in progress. So I'm kind of showing it to you and I would love to hear your feedback on that. But the way, the way it looks right now, it kind of has two dimensions. So there's this left to right dimension. And that is the way how we, the process view of developing an AI governance structure or of, of doing of creating AI governance. And it starts with you do need to understand the underlying technology. And what is what are the distinguishing characteristics of AI vis-a-vis -vis all the other technologies that companies already have. Then we need to understand what is the impact of those technical phone, uh, characteristics on the foundations of governance. And then then what governance structures should we have in place to make sure that the impacts are appropriately considered? And finally, the actual enactment of governance, and this is the application of the process, governance processes and governance structures in making the various decisions that relate to AI. And then there is this um, 
uh, vertical dimension. Now, the vertical dimension really describes the structural uh, components that need to be taken in, into account at each of those process steps. So I didn't go into a lot of details here on the technical, but it sort of tries to outline what are the particular characteristics of AI technology that is different from what would be your other IT. And the example is that it is data-driven. It is based on machine learning and it is highly scalable. And each of those has its own uh, ramifications. Now, for impact, again, here's where we draw on a lot of institutional theory and organizational theory. And we look about the uh, look at the decision processes, so the stakeholder enfranchisement, and we look at the distribution of value, and that is your claimancy rights in theoretical terms. And then, of course, our IT governance literature gives us uh, uh, our regulation theory gives us the structures that need to be in place, including the principles. What is important for us? Are applicants impo important stakeholders? Or is it just the, uh, the shareholders? And then the processes, the roles and collaborations, such as committees, what kind of standards, policies, procedures should, uh, do we, what kind of forms do we want to um, inscribe our governance is, and the culture. And then this is the enactment, simply defines the different types of decisions that are related to AI, from strategy to investment decisions, to acquisition decisions, use decisions and uh, AI assisted decisions because AI is really part of uh, decision making. Next slide. And so um, I do not think that I have enough time to really revisit the scenario in a lot of details, but approaching that same scenario from this kind of a framework perspective, if we look at the foundations, we'll look at the use of AI, which is a black box, and that requires new types of data. And if we look at the impact understanding, we need to look at who are the stakeholders that would be gaining or losing from us adopting this type of system. So we may have shareholders who may gain because we may be doing things more effectively, but our potential employees may lose because they lose privacy. And then we can look at what kind of governance structures do we want to have in place? Do we care about applicants as stakeholders? So these are our principles and priorities. Do we have processes for evaluation, AI investments in an HR function, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, when we have all of those in place, we can more comfortably approach the decision. Do we invest in this particular solution? And with that, I think I'm one. Anna, you muted it again. That's when I click on my slide, really hoping that I will, um, I will move it myself. So again, um, this is a very, very brief, very high level introduction into the kind of work that we are doing and what you can see there, it's really a blend of trying to understand the depth of the technology and relate it to your very traditional organizational concepts and provide uh, guidance for organizational decision making, not just the technical engineering guidance. And with that, here's my email address and back to you guys. Right. It looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat, so we'll just um, highlight those really quickly. Um, yep. Tabitha, uh, are you able to see those? Yes, uh, okay. I have one for Joel. It asks, do you face apprehension from HR teams who may be concerned that AI presents a risk to their jobs? If so, how have you found ways to approach this concern as you present AI solutions to them? Yeah, and it's not just HR teams. Um, really, a lot of people have apprehension and uh, especially in talent science where we focus a lot around the hiring process and, and we have solutions elsewhere, but especially in the hiring process, uh, recruiters can be really concerned because the recruiting field is, is very large. Uh, there's a lot of recruiters out there. Some of you on the phone may be recruiters and it's, it's an important 
function in an organization. And it also can, to some extent, be automated so that it can have tools and capabilities that allow fewer recruiters to do more work. So there's a very real um, threat there. And I've actually had um, one organization, I remember, uh, decide not to renew their contract with us because they wanted to hire another recruiter. And uh, it was either hire a recruiter or renew our contract because they were about the same price. Um, and that company uh, is no longer in business. Uh, they, uh, they kind of um, try to keep doing things the way they've been doing things. And uh, it's been um, many years since that decision was made, but um, it, it's hard to feel warm and fuzzy about a technology. It's, it's much more easy to feel attached to your people. Um, as business leaders, we just need to find opportunities for people and opportunities for technology to coexist and just be smart in our workforce planning. The reality is many jobs will be displaced in the future, not just in HR. And I'm just trying to help HR leaders get ahead of all that for their workforce and for themselves. Uh, similarly, and you kind of answered it a little bit, but Christopher asks, are there any best practices or industry leaders you have seen relating to automating prospective talent pipelines on a national or international scale? Uh, he says he's the sole talent sourcer on a global talent acquisition team, and he's researching potential solutions to creating an interactive prospective talent community that is engaged and cultivated with limited FTEs to manage. Yeah, I, there's, I would just encourage an RFP, a request for proposals, and get everyone to put their best foot forward. Um, certainly, N4 has a lot of offerings, and we'd be happy to you know, meet with any business leaders, um, but I don't want this to be a pitch about me and my company and to other companies. I just think that if you want to formally consider something for your organization, don't be afraid to do something like a request for proposals where you're saying, hey, we're looking to spend some money on technology to improve things. I don't have a lot of FTEs, but I know I can bring in value through an investment and cloud software providers are booming um, around all sorts of talent management type activities. Uh, I think this is the last one that I see and it might be unanswerable, um, but Petra asks, well, she says that you mentioned how attention is one of the most scarce assets nowadays. How can we fix this issue? <laughs> so I actually encourage all of you to read Kevin Kelly's book, The Inevitable. So he was the founder of Wired Magazine, and that's where I got that stat about attention being the last scarce resource. As we move into the service economy, um, everything becomes more digital, cheaper. Uh, the economic prosperity is, is actually amazing that's out there, and, and there's plenty now more than ever. I mean, I look like a king, um, but what I have less of than any of my ancestors is attention. Um, and if you're still paying attention to this, then I, then I guess I'm doing something right. So thank you for your attention. And I don't think there's an easy way to solve it, except that we need to probably all be aware more personally of where we're investing our attention because AI is trying to take our attention. My four teenage boys um, will get into the YouTube hole of the longer and longer videos basically they're watching. Productivity is definitely challenging. So personally, I guess pay attention to where you're putting your scarce resource, but then in terms of how to get the attention of all the people out there, learn about marketing because <laughs> that's what they're all trying to do is grab your attention. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I know that we are running out of time. Uh, so I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I wanted to take a minute to, to thank both Joel and Anna for sharing that information with us. Um, I know that that is useful for many of us who are either interested from a research perspective or from a practical perspective on how AI is being integrated into the workforce and has already, um, you know, taken some jobs from people and how we can like be mindful of the attention that we're spending, like you said, um, where that goes and how we can maybe protect our own jobs um, as AI, AI continues to be and use it for our own benefits um, and the benefits of the organizations that we're working for. Um, so I just wanna also quickly say, um, we have some save the dates for everybody um, moving forward. So April 8th is gonna be our next HR collaborative event. Um, we are still in the process of determining topic and finalizing that with our speakers. So um, keep that date in mind. It'll be at the same time, one o'clock. Um, we'll also be doing another virtual one on September the 9th. We're hoping at that point that we're all able to maybe start thinking about getting back together in person. Um, so if you're an HR, if you're a UNT alum, uh, we're gonna be having, in theory, our HR alumni dinner again. We'll be celebrating the fifth year in, anniversary in the sixth year of doing it um, because we couldn't do it this past October. Um, but make 
make a note of the date, October 21st. Uh, we're hoping to do that obviously in person, <laughs> otherwise we'll delay the fifth anniversary again. Um, and then finally, then on November 4th, um, we're looking to host a, an exec HR executive networking event. So, um, you know, if you're working for an organization where you think that somebody might be interested in attending that's at that higher level, uh, interested to learn a little bit more about what we're doing at UNT um, in terms of our in HR collaborative events and HR initiatives, um, please pass that information and save the data along. We'll have more information coming to you. Um, I wanna also thank Kathy Western for helping organize this along with Danielle Cooper. Uh, we're excited to have Kathy on board now full-time at UNT. Um, so welcome Kathy officially to our UNT family. Um, and I'd also like to thank Tabitha for all of her technical expertise that I certainly do not have for running this Zoom meeting successfully. So thank you so much. And thank you all for taking the time this afternoon to be here. Um, we know your attention can be anywhere at this point. So, um, so thank you all so much. And we hope to see you on April 8th. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Philo. Thank you. We can stop the recording. Let's see.